<laughs> fish. Fish is also full of minerals and hence is used all over the world as a hangover cure, hence kippers and kedgeree for breakfast. In Mexico, they serve the fish raw with beer and popcorn. Sounds all right to me. Another popular cure involves marinating raw herring fillets for five days in a mixture of vinegar, capers, bay leaves, juniper berries, hot mustard, raw onion rings and dill pickle. This is a German recipe. <laughs> if you wake up with a hangover, you make a German eat it, and this will make you feel better. <laughs> <laughs> but the best thing you can do with food is to eat it at night before going out drinking. Experts say that the best things to eat in order to absorb the alcohol and filter out the poisons, the best things to eat are lots of potatoes and pasta and fish and olive oil and six tablets of charcoal, not barbecue briquettes obviously, four <laughs> tablets of vitamin C and loads and loads and loads of cabbage. But the chances are you won't. <laughs> and if you did, you'd be too sick to go out anyway. <laughs> but serious drinkers don't like food because food takes up valuable space that they require for alcohol. <laughs> that is, until after the pub's shut. When this ancient folk memory comes calling from deep inside, saying, better go and have a meal now. Get something solid inside you. That'll line your stomach. <laughs> no, it won't. It might have lined your stomach about five or six hours ago. All it's going to do now is provide something to bobble around on top of all the liquid. Threatening an imminent reappearance. <laughs> like a pizza. Pizzas have infiltrated our drinking culture. Ten years ago, everybody used to round off a serious evening's drinking in the time-honoured, patriotic, British bulldog manner, with a curry. But these days, these days, the traditional British curry has been replaced by foreign muck. Pizzas. We're being swamped by an alien culture. The damn things are everywhere. You go into a major supermarket these days, there's three aisles of freezers crammed with the damn things. Spotty youths on motorcycles deliver them to your flat at all hours of the day and night, whether you've ordered one or not. And here in Glasgow, they actually serve pizzas in fish and chip shops. Mind you, credit where credit's due. At least the Scots do treat pizzas with the contempt they deserve. I was up here in the City of Culture a couple of months ago to see, a, to see an Esperanto dance company performing a hip-hop version of Mill on the Floss. I went into a chippy about one in the morning, as you do. There was a woman in the queue in front of me. I think she'd had a drink. Anyway, <laughs> she looked the guy behind the counter in the eye. She looked him in the eye and she said, I said, you're serving her a pizza. She looked him in the eye and said, can I have some extra donor kebab on that? <laughs> the really gruesome thing was the guy didn't bat an eyelid. Aye, why not slap it on, salt and sauce? But the really, really frightful stuff had already happened. Do you know how they cook pizzas in these chippies? <laughs> first of all, now this is crucial, first of all, they lie in wait for a drunk to come in <laughs> and order one. Then, barely able to conceal his smirk, <laughs> the chef... <laughs> the chef carefully plucks a gourmet frozen pizza from a cardboard cash and carry box. You've got a less than 50-50 chance of him taking the cling film off. The drunk, the drunk looks all round the chippy in vain for any sign of a pizza oven. Then, with a skill and dexterity you won't see anywhere else on the planet, the chef disdainfully lobs the pizza into the vat of filthy hot boiling lard, along with all the smoked sausages and the haggises and the fish and chicken, all bubbling around together like so much untreated sewage. Then, then an incredible thing happens before your very eyes, as the level of the filthy hot boiling lard in the vat drops by several inches in seconds as the bloated pizza sucks it all out. But as with all continental delicacies, 
presentation is everything. <laughs> the chef carefully plucks the pizza from the greasy vat. There's no fat in there at all by now, it's all in here. <laughs> and he slaps it down on a sheet of brown paper with a sickening squelch. Pizza and brown paper are instantly welded together, <laughs> never again to be parted, thereby giving the pizza its only roughage content. <laughs> the drunk is over the moon. <laughs> this is going to stop him getting a hangover. A bargain at £4.75. <laughs> but then a bewildered look enters his eyes when he leaves the chippy as he tries to work out how he's going to get this obscenity into his face. But fortunately, it's not a problem he has to ponder for long, for within seconds of getting home, nature takes its inevitable course and he gets his face into the pizza. Splat! <laughs> so, is this where you should say, never again? Let's see what Sir Kingsley Amis has to say on the subject of hangovers. If your wife or other partner is beside you <laughs> and, of course, is willing, perform the sexual act as vigorously as you can. <laughs> well, all very well for Kingsley Amos. <laughs> But what about the poor wretch on the receiving end? <laughs> Can you imagine starting your day with a filthy hangover and a dry-mouthed hump with Kingsley Amis? <laughs> huffing and puffing and belching oysters and brandy into your face? <laughs> Perhaps this should be made compulsory. That'd get the country back on its feet. If people knew that every time they woke up with the hangover, Kingsley Amos was going to come round and have sex with them as vigorously as he could. People might think twice before having too much to drink the night before. Hey, look, do yourselves a favour. Tomorrow, go out to your local bookshop and buy one of his novels. You don't have to read it. Just, just keep it as a warning to yourself, as a, as a deterrent. Keep it under your pillow to remind yourself that Next time you wake up with a hangover, Kingsley Amos is going to come round and sit on your face. <laughs> <laughs> Dr Moira Plant of the Edinburgh University Alcohol Research Unit says, It is important that all women understand that alcohol affects them differently from men. She says that whereas 21 units a week is the safe limit for men, that women should limit their intake to 14 units. Not a lot, is it? 14 units. Are they worth going out, really? I would have thought. <laughs> May as well just stay at home and get Keith Waterhouse and Kingsley Amos to come round and <laughs> breathe in your face. <laughs> the accepted pub wisdom over the years has been that Women are more susceptible to the effects of alcohol because they are, on average, smaller and lighter than men. Well, apparently, this is a contributory factor. But the latest research, published at the universities of New York and Trieste, and supported by Dr. Plant's findings in Edinburgh, suggests that the reason is genetic. That women's livers are less efficient at producing this crucial enzyme, enzyme 2, and that therefore they get drunk quicker than men and suffer more severe hangovers. So, let's get this straight. What the medical evidence is suggesting is that women are able to get embarrassingly and devastatingly drunk quicker than men. So, the big question facing medical science today is, why don't they? <laughs> I mean, you don't see great gangs of women roaming the streets at closing time, do you? Tipping over litter bins, singing football songs, urinating in shop doorways, and barging into Indian restaurants, making jokes about dead dogs, and waking up an hour later face down in a meat madras and being confronted with a bill for 15 people they can't even remember meeting. <laughs> women don't behave like that. Except in Newcastle on Friday nights, obviously. <laughs>